It was 1974 when Naj was founded. What was it like to be a judge in 1974? Well, the minimum wage was $2 an hour for most people, but judges didn't get paid minimum wage. In fact, they didn't get paid at all. It was strictly volunteer work. However, they did get to eat anything they wanted from the concession stand. In 1974, Naj was able to establish a fee schedule. Beginning judges were paid $5 a session, and a session was two and a half or more hours. But they still got to eat all they wanted from the concession stand. In 1974, you could buy a new car for $3,800, and gas was $0.42 cents a gallon. But judges didn't have to worry about gas or mileage reimbursement, because they rode to meets in a crowded team van along with the coaches and athletes. In 1974, the United States lost its president. Naj, on the other hand, inaugurated its first president, Kitty Kelson, and the board met for the very first time in November of that year. In the fashion world, polyester was the fabric of choice, and this no doubt influenced the decision to deck our judges out in polyester uniforms in a color called Association Blue. Hot pants were still the rage. Even Southwest Airlines went for this look for their flight attendant uniforms. But Nash opted for a longer version called bell-bottom pants, which had become popular after Sonny and Cher wore them on television. Gymnastics leotards were also different in 1974. They were not adorned with crystals as they are today. The only thing shiny on the leotards was the zipper. In contrast, 184 Savorsky crystals decorated the Olympic leotards in 2008. This grew to 1,188 in 2012 and to a whopping 5,500 in 2016. Judges had lots of entertainment options when they weren't busy judging. Blazing Saddles was the top-grossing movie, appropriate given our symposium theme this year. Quincy M.E. was a popular TV show. There was even an episode that featured gymnastics. What am I doing wrong? You're rushing your routine. Would you just relax? Girls, I'm Dr. Quincy. I'm with the medical examiner's office. I'm looking for Miss Hart. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Ann Kaiser. Nice to meet you. Uh, Miss Hart's due back any minute now. Is there anything I can help you with? No, no, I'll wait. Do you mind if I watch? Heck no. You work better with an audience. Thank you. When it came to music, Barbara Streisand had the number one song on the Billboard charts. Her hit single, The Way We Were, used both piano and orchestra. Recorded, orchestrated music, however, wasn't allowed in gymnastics in 1974. Only piano music was allowed. So, in 1974, each team brought a pianist with them to the competition. An important peripheral person in all these gymnastics competitions is the accompanist. Each team brings their own, and the performance and the music must be perfectly joined together. Balance beam was also different in 1974. Gymnasts competed on solid wood beams without any covering. But the gymnasts at the 1974 World Championships got to work out on beams with two different new covers, leather or carpet, to see how they liked each one. They voted for leather. I think we're glad about that. Beam made the news not just because it was soon to be covered, Olga Corbett had shocked the gymnastics world in 1972 when she did a backflip on beam. By 1974, the FIG had decided that the backflip was not characteristic of movements on beam. Countries that allowed their athletes to use this skill were going to be held personally responsible for any injuries. The FIG ordered a study to analyze the safety of the backflip 
for female athletes. I guess they didn't anticipate what was to come. The U.S. was busy picking its national team for 1974. Kathy Rigby and her husband were the announcers for the competition. Kathy continued in sports broadcasting for 18 years while simultaneously starring on Broadway as Peter Pan. The U.S. team for the 1974 World Championships included our own judge, Joan Rice, now Joan Nat. Joan is pictured in the middle, along with Jeanette Anderson, Diane Dunbar, Debbie Fike, Ann Carr, Kathy Howard, and Barbie Mislack. The U.S. finished in a respectable sixth place at the World Championships, but the Soviet Union dominated the competition. They won the team gold. In addition, Olga Korbut won vault, Ludmila Tereshcheva won beam, floor, and the all-around. In 1974, the United States Gymnastics Federation, USGF, had only been the governing body for four years. Verena French was the vice president for women. She was also one of the founders of Judges Certification, Inc., JCI, a group formed in 1966 to establish a credentialing program for judges. Verena scored all of our tests from 1966 to 1994 when injuries from a car accident forced her to give up the job. Today, Connie Maloney administers all of our tests, and Annie Heffernan is the Vice President for Women's Gymnastics. Both have been important advocates for judges and have made significant contributions to our history. USGF published a magazine called USGF News. Let's take a look at one 1974 issue. The editorial by Frank Bauer told the story of the darkest day in the FIG's long existence. This was a result of political maneuvering that resulted in the World Championships being moved from Munich to Varna, Bulgaria. This edition also reported on Olga Corbett's appearance at Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. Turn the page and you'll see that Joan Rice had made history by winning the national championships for a fourth straight year. That record stood until just recently when none other than Simone Biles surpassed the record. Gymnast Magazine was also published in 1974. A popular section was called Girl on the Beam. It featured one picture each month highlighting a local gymnast or a team. In this issue, the Girl on the Beam photo was Joni Miller from Nards Gymnastics in Amarillo, Texas. In a later issue, this photo was featured with the caption, Girl on the Beam? Or is it under the beam? The magazine also printed news about collegiate gymnastics. The 1974 Nationals were sponsored by the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. The meet was won by Southern Illinois University. Although the NCAA sponsored the men's national championships since 1938, it was not until 1982 that the NCAA sponsored the women's nationals. However, at the men's nationals in 1974, computers were used for the first time. In an article by Jim Walton, he answered the question, what can a computer tell you? Well, he said, it can give you the standings in any given event. It can give you the team total at any time during the competition, and it can tell you where a given performer stands in the all-around. We've come a long way with live scoring available over Wi-Fi on smartphones. 1974 marked another important first. It was the year of the first USGF Junior Nationals. The competition had 15 athletes in total, from seven of the eight regions. A car accident prevented Region 5 from making it to the meet. There were two age divisions, junior and senior. The meet was exhausting for the athletes because they competed compulsory and optionals on the same day. There were lots of falls attributed to fatigue. 
the meet was changed to a two-day format the next year. In contrast, the 2019 Nationals had 12 age divisions with 56 athletes in each for a total of 672 competitors. Region 5 not only made it to Nationals this year, they won the Super Team Award. In 1974, the world was preparing for the new compulsories that would come out a couple of years later. The film test was a controversial subject. Jackie Fye reported that she had heard the routines would be on loop film. Quote, This is very unfortunate. The cost is prohibitive. It would be so nice to have them available on Super 8 film. Unquote. In the junior program, another controversy was brewing. Renee Hendershot reported in the USGF News that she had been approached by a befuddled coach with the compulsory routines in hand, saying, I would like to know what you judges are looking for in the pre-flight for the layout squat vault. Those who were involved in gymnastics in this era will recall that at one time the pre-flight was supposed to be high, and at another time, it was supposed to be low. Well, this year, we heard the same question from more than a few befuddled coaches and judges while we tried to learn how to judge the new 6-7 vaults. Finally, one of the 1974 issues of Gymnast Magazine printed this photo of the nation's top judges and asked readers to name them. Unfortunately, the answers weren't provided, so we would like to invite you to help us with the names. We will post copies of this photo in several symposium rooms, and if you recognize any of the judges, please write the name on the photo. One thing that you'll notice that has changed is that these judges aren't wearing a uniform. There's nothing that identifies them as meet officials. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and this next picture says it all. In closing, Lee Bella prepared the historical overview for our last national symposium held in Atlanta in 2014. She passed away unexpectedly a year and a half later. The history section of the NAJ website is dedicated to Lee because she was such a great historian and web communicator. In memory of Lee, this video will close with the last slide of her 2014 presentation. Far from being the end, we're here to explore new frontiers and steer our path forward. We hope you enjoy the program and the camaraderie of this, our 45th anniversary.